So, um, as mentioned, um, the Vice President responsible for economic development. Um, just to give you a brief history uh, and a brief overview of the Nunavik region, uh, we are the first modern day land claim uh, signed in 1975. Um, and as you saw, Senator Charlie Watt is, uh, is the pioneer. Uh, that led a group of young men into um, a battle what became uh, the first modern land claims agreement in 1975, uh, being threatened by a development uh, corporation, um, basically attempting to dam a river that, uh, that would affect the lives uh, of the Inuit of northern Quebec for many generations to come. And we've had a lot of history in regards to how, uh, how we've had to cope and develop around that. Um, but I believe uh, that the land claims provided us with a lot of uh, opportunities um, that we may not have, have had uh, subsequently. So I will try to manage. So, uh, just to give you a spectrum of uh, what uh, what our department does, um, this is basically a one-page view of what files and initiatives that the Economic Development Department works on uh, in regards to uh, trying to benefit and maximize opportunities uh, in Northern Quebec. Um, in re and we've basically structured it in uh, four pillars. Uh, in or for, sorry, five main pillars that we have: uh, industry sector. There's a lot of activities in mining, energy, um, things in tourism development that we're just starting to launch, um, and many others. Economic development, accessing government programs, um, the development of a chamber of commerce. Uh, the only Inuit region that does not have a Chamber of Commerce, but uh, incorporation is uh, due, uh, I would say, in about a few weeks. Um, we are one of the uh, biggest landowners um, in, uh, in all of Canada. Uh, we have uh, more than 7,000 islands that, uh, that we own outright 100%, um, which was signed in 2008. Uh, as the Nunavik Inuit Land Claims Agreement. That's subsequent to the Land Claims Agreement signed in 1975. Uh, Socioeconomic initiatives, as much as possible, we help our hunters uh, and our seamstresses with uh, initiatives that we put in place um, covering uh, repair costs for sewing machines so that women seamstresses can provide uh, uh, warm clothing for the hunters. Uh, and as well as uh, firearm repairs uh, that may not be easily accessible uh, in the north uh, to provide hunters the tools that they need to provide uh, meat uh, for their homes and, and their families. Um, support programs, um, doing initiatives in regards to training, uh, capacity building, um, youth and women entrepreneurship. Uh, actually, right now we have uh, we have a sponsorship going on with five individuals in Edmonton attending a young entrepreneur symposium, and these are the kind of in initiatives that will that will have uh, uh, fruitful outcomes down the line uh, with uh, investing in in uh, youth as well as women. Um, small business support, uh, business mentorship, um, as well as uh, the Artisan Collective. Uh, arts is a great deal of importance for many of the Inuit who supplement their, their income uh, with, uh, with, art, with their artistic capabilities. And lastly, into policy, which is uh, the, my, the core of my presentation, is the procurement policy. Uh, Nunavik Inuit Enterprise, and I'll touch touch upon the James Bay Implementation Office that uh, I coordinate. Uh, so, in regards to uh, the policy, the Nunavik Inuit Enterprise is a registry managed and coordinated by Makivik Corporation. This um, 
this initiative is to identify uh, legitimate uh, Inuit companies. Uh, this, this initiative makes sure that there is a policy in place to identify Inuit businesses that are not being abused by southern companies to use their name, to use their status as Inuit to access preferential treatments. This is something that uh, we are currently having vetted by an external law firm, um, so that an external law firm, so that we do not come into the uh, area of being accused of being conflict of interest. Makavik owns many businesses, including two airlines, one national, uh, First Air. First Air is 100% uh, owned by Makavik Corporation as well as Air Inuit, uh, a very successful regional airline uh, servicing within, within Quebec. Um, I, I was the chairman for Air Inuit for eight years, and the amount of uh, initiatives that we brought back to the region uh, were totaling more than $17 million per annum uh, by the time I was uh, uh, replaced by non-elected officials. So right now, we are working on our process of identifying uh, the Nunavik Inuit Enterprises Registry. This is very similar to Nunavut's NNI policy, uh, and this is something that we are uh, working towards uh, identifying uh, as well as having it endorsed by our own board of directors so that it could be solidified with the support of the, cor of the corporation as a whole as well as managed by the corporation on behalf of all beneficiaries of uh, Northern Quebec. So with that, that would allow us to ensure that the different aspects, the different realities of, um, of the Inuit businesses um, to identify uh, various benefits um, using uh, different f different factors that um, uh, that the Inuit may uh, may or may have, uh, such as uh, a comparison between a 51% owned company uh, from Inuit as well as uh, to 100% Inuit owned. So scoring parameters will allow this to be uh, to be vetted. Uh, different initiatives such as uh, points registered for having an office within the region, uh, points allocated uh, for having uh, year-round business within the region itself, uh, points included for the investment into, into the region. How, 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 what kind of um, uh, investments uh, does this company allow uh, for um, to providing initiatives uh, as well as supporting uh, supporting other businesses, uh, and it could be uh, while getting a contract, supporting and uh, subcontracting local businesses, lo other local businesses to to complete the projects, uh, as well as uh, points for implementing training programs for for Inuit. We'll also review. Uh, level of Inuit employment, uh, how, how, what, what percentage of Inuit employment, uh, including training programs delivered to, uh, to complete a project. Um, points for majority of e employees living or working in Nunavik. Level of local and uh, Inuit management. Um, having managers developing the managerial skills with, uh, with Inuit uh, will have benefits to ensure that, uh, that the Inuit are being trained to be capable managers um, to, to make sure that uh, down the line that they have the skills developed to, to manage projects. Having uh, points allocated for majority uh, Inuit management within within the company. It could be a joint venture, but depending on the managers uh, who make those decisions locally, uh, how, how can this be um, identified and uh, basically benefited towards um, uh, the support of the company? Uh, points for Inuit partner being qualified in a joint venture. 
uh, how much of the involvement of the joint venture allows jo the Inuit partner to, to benefit from. Points for individual Inuit, Inuit portion in, jo in, jo in joint ventures um, in regards to requiring our operating permits, licensing, uh, such as en engineering, um, these kind of things that would allow uh, training benefits of, of Inuit to, to take a larger role within, uh, within a project. So in regards to the, in regards to the procurement policy, um, once we have the NIE structure in place, that would allow us to implement a solid procurement policy. Uh, the idea is to increase the number of Inuit businesses bidding and winning on public contracts, undertake to modify the law in order to allow institutions of public government to set up a process of awarding contracts for goods and services that gives priority to Nunavik Inuit enterprises. This is actually an identified in their land claims, but the wording is, is questionable. I mean, the reason why I say that is the government um, I agreed to look at the process. They never agreed to implement the process. And this is, this is the questionable status that, uh, that we question today. Having the agreement signed in 1975, 40, 40 plus years later, we question, did the federal government have the best interest of the Inuit in hand to implement this? So in regards to implementing our next initiatives, um, we intend to develop this, these positions, both positions in tandem with each other, the NIE structure that provides properly identified Inuit companies and a procurement process that is fair and equitable to the best of, of the abilities of the Inuit that, can, that they can provide. We'll also engage with the provincial governments for any contracts coming from government being implemented within the region, as well as developing a procurement strategy for the Nunavik region for our public services within Nunavik also adhere to this initiative. So with the process at hand, uh, we feel that this will provide a greater strength and position for uh, for the Inuit of Northern Quebec to develop strong base Inuit companies that would allow more independence, uh, more self-reliant, uh, as well as job creation for, for Inuit uh, across the communities. We do have 14 communities, uh, ranging with populations from 200 to a little over 3,500. So we range uh, with different aspects, different realities, even difference uh, in, in realities from community to community. Um, so there's a lot of initiatives and a lot of uh, factors that we need to take in place uh, in order to make sure that we provide a fair and equi equitable process that recognizes each and every Inuit beneficiary as an equal. So in, uh, in closing, I wanted to mention um, a couple of other factors that I question today. Like I mentioned, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement um, in 19, was signed in 1975. That's shortly after all the residential schools were happening, the 60s scoop, and you can imagine Charlie uh, as a young young man, leading the way of ha having a group of Inuit challenging the Quebec government, facing the federal bureaucrats in regards to the the things that are hap that were happening back then in the in the north. And looking at it now, you question: Did the federal government do? its fiduciary responsibility in properly representing the Inuit back then when the Quebec government was challenging the Inuit and going ahead with their, with their dam, damming of the river. Reconciliation can be translated in many ways. 
But rec true reconciliation is fixing the wrong that was done back then. But also moving forward, allowing the Inuit to prosper for future generations to come. Did the federal government implement their fiduciary responsibility by allowing the Quebec government to have the Inuit surrender their rights to the land back in 1975? These lands were and have been supporting the Inuit generations for thousands of years. We have historical data, we have uh, archaeology sites that confirms that we have been living in this land for thousands of years. But did the federal government implement their fiduciary responsibility to support the best interest of the Inuit as they should? Why was it that in order for, for us to access public services that are duly available to all Canadians across Canada, education, health, security, policing, all these services are available to any Canadian. But why did we have to surrender our right to the land in order to get these services? It begs to question how these agreements could be achieved back then. But at the same time, did our leaders know any better back then? Limited education. All they knew before, uh, before colonialism was tr living off the land, living off tradition, living off abundance of rivers full of fish, abundance of caribou from the land, seasonal moves to different areas of the region to follow the wildlife. That's the lifestyle that they knew had before. But at the same time, these land claims agreements are not set in stone. These are living documents. These are documents that could be modified, could be updated. And 40 years later, I believe that uh, it's, it's time that the Nunavik Inuit land claims and specifically the James Bay and the Quebec Agreement are revisited to allow Inuit to have a better stake, bear and better and e equitable stake from before. So I want to thank you for uh, your time today and your listen. Thank you for listening, and we'll be. I believe we'll be able to have time for questions and uh, and answers uh, after that. Thank you. Good morning, Elita Namik. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Sarah Leo, the Vice President of Corporate Development for NGC. My presentation is going to be a little different than um, Andy's. I think it was important for us to share as a company um, who we are and what we do and how we are working on economic reconciliation ourselves in our territory. Um, I think we're doing quite well, and I really like what um, Senator Watts said this morning. I have nothing to reconcile, and I think that speaks a lot about our company as well because we're working on that. We're, we're doing what we can to ensure that the Inuit in our territory are prospering and learning, and we're, we're working towards economic growth. <clears throat> so I come from Nunatsiavut. We have a land claims agreement called the Labrador Inuit Land Claims Agreement. This was signed in 2005 after 30 plus years of negotiation. And I just want to mention, again, speaking of um, Senator Watt, while we were downstairs, we sort of missed the, the meeting this morning because of communication. But anyways, we had a chance to talk. And, and Charlie Watt, being from um, Nunavik, has traveled back and forth to Nunavik by snowmobile and by plane. And he was talking about a story in 1971 when I believe Nunavik was starting its negotiations and starting looking at land claims. And they actually traveled to Nunatsiavut, back then it was Labrador, by snowmobile to talk to the Inuit in, in Labrador about land claims and what they were doing and sort of started the process there. 
And that's kind of where our land claim started was through those discussions. So into the, the land claims was signed in 2005 and in 2006, the Labrador Inuit Capital Strategy Stru Trust was created. Clint is one of the trustees on the trust. And this trust was created to manage um, basically manage economic development within Nunatsiavut and keep economic development and the business side of it at arm's length from the government. Um, so it's very much, we are very, unlike other organizations, we keep, keep our business arm very separate from the government. There's a distinct line there. The Nunatsiavut group of companies is a development corporation. It's a business entity. We report as a company to the trust who are the ones that report to the government, our national, our, our Nunatsiavut Assembly. So as a business, we have no connection to the government whatsoever except through our trust. So annually, the LICST, the trust, reports to the assembly and holds us as a company accountable for what we're doing. Again, even though at arm's length, we're held accountable to the government and to the Inuit whose money we have been entrusted to manage and to create wealth out of. This beautiful picture is the Nunatsiavut Assembly. The Nunatsia, I guess I didn't really say what was included in our land claims. Our land claims agreement allows for not only a land claims agreement, but a self-governing agreement as well. So we have our own Nunatsiavut Assembly, which governs our territory of Nunatsiavut. This is our beautiful um, assembly chambers in the legislative capital of Nunatsiavut. And, and I had to sort of pause for a minute because within our territory, we have two capitals. We have the legislative capital, which is in the community of Hopedale. And this is where this beautiful assembly building, this assembly room is. We have the administrative capital, which is in the community of Nain. So it's, we're very diverse. Um, so in 2011, prior to um, the Nunatsiavut group of companies being created, we, have a, we had a corporation called the Labrador Inuit Development Corporation. The Labrador Inuit Development Corporation was there to, um, to manage some economic development, but not so much on a profit, a for-profit basis. They were there to um, create employment, but to train people to sort of start up businesses for other people to run. That's how it was created. But in 2011, the mandate was changed. The Nunatsiavut group of companies was, was created, and our purpose was to create wealth um, and to manage the, to create wealth for Inuit through our business lines. So this is now what our businesses are through the Nunatsiavut group of companies. You'll see off to the left, Universal Helicopters, which we own, the Capital Strategy Trust owns a share in. And then we also have 100% owned businesses such as Nunatsiavut Construction, Nunak Land, um, the Town Center in Goose Bay. Those are our 100% owned subsidiaries, Nunatsiavut Solutions, another one. Then we've created a lot of partnerships. And we've created these partnerships just for the capacity. We don't have the capacity to own an airline. We don't have the capacity to run them to own boats, um, to build, to have bigger construction companies. We have a smaller construction company, and I'll show what some, some of what they do, but the bigger um, construction pieces, we didn't have the capacity. So it, in order to take advantage of any opportunities that came up with regards to any economic development, we, we created these partnerships. We have Timiak, we have Air Borealis, the regional airline, Torngat Services, which runs camp services at the Voices Bay mine site. We have PAL, we won't talk about that. We, and we have Nuluak Fisheries, um, which we own quota and we have bigger boats fish that for us. So again, these are our companies and I'll just talk briefly talk about each of them. We have Universal. Um, we own through the LICST 30, you have to remind me, Chris, how much do we own in Universal? Oh, uh, 40%. 40%. Sorry. 
it's one of, that's okay. I was I was doing a presentation at a hockey tournament. We sponsored the trophies at the hockey tournament this weekend in our community, and I was there talking about the trophies that we were sponsoring and we were presenting, and I call them turkeys. <laughs> it was pretty good. So uh, through the presentation, I'm going to talk about our companies. I'm also going to talk about our corporate social responsibility, which is a big part of our company, and as well as how we're looking ahead in improving what we're doing within our region. So one of our companies that we're really proud of is Nunitz Havot Construction. This is a small construction company that that does work in each of our five communities. And again, I sort of went too fast over our land claims agreement. Our land claims agreement, within our territory, we have five communities, five Inuit distinct communities. And each of those communities are governed by their own community government separate from the Nunitz Havot government. So back to Nunitz Havot Construction. This is a small construction company that we use to do homes, to do smaller buildings, um, basically any kind of construction, smaller construction within our territory. So last year they had booked over six million dollars worth of work, which is quite an amount considering how small our communities are. Um, we won the tender to renovate the Nunez. The Nunez government has housing dollars that they get um, through their own budget as well as other sources. So we've won the contract to renovate homes, part of their whole um, addressing housing, the housing crisis really that exists within our, within our territory is renovating the homes um, and building new homes. So we have the contract to, to renovate these homes and you'll see benef beneficiaries accounted for 66% of our workforce. And I wanna say, I think that's higher. I think those numbers are a little off. Maybe I'm just a little biased. But when you look at a community, and our community is 1,200 people, we have, I'm counting the guys in my head, I think we have 15 employees working in Nunez Havot Construction. Out of those 15 employees, 13 of them are Inuit. Um, the other two are both spouses or partners with Inuit, so they're part of the community anyway. So they're basically those 15 people, they're all local employees. Um, one of the other things about Nunez have construction is these, oh, I didn't say it. The, the people that we have working with our company, with Nunez have construction, they're not carpenters, our local employees. They're just laborers that we picked up, gave them a job. And over the years that they've been working with our com company, they've gained the carpentry skills to be able to build homes, to be able to work on these projects. And that's a lot of what we do as a company. Um, so we like to do that through all of our, our companies, is, is building the capacity, taking these people who have no experience, who have no qualifications, and giving them that experience and qualifications. And if they, work with us and move on to something else because of the qualifications they've gained through our companies, all the power to them. That's part of who we are in, in, in thank you. Okay, no problem. Are you afraid it's gonna blow up? <laughs> no, no, it's a catch on. So, I think that, that's another part of our CSR really, is cre creating the, the workforce, not only for, for our companies, but so that they're able to expand. Universal Helicopters, as I said, was 44% owned by us. Um, their big focus is on growth, um, maintaining the traditional market. It's an indigenous partnership, and they've recently expanded into the U.S. They're actually doing quite well. They've got um, a partnership in B.C. They've just since recently expanded into um, the California area. So they're doing really well for a universal, for a helicopter company and we're quite proud of them, quite proud of them. This is one of the shots that they did a lot of the work on the transmission line for the Muskrat Falls project. And these are one of the shots from that. <clears throat> Nunat Tablet Marine. This is, um, I guess this is one of those stories where we can really talk about 
economic re reconciliation where the government comes into play. Um, up to this, at the end of this year, we, the, the boat that's pictured in the here is, an, is a Northern Ranger. This is the passenger ferry boat that provides service to Nunatsiavut as well as our friends in the um, Inu Reserve of Natwashish. Um, this brings in freight, this brings in people. It's our only passenger boat. So for the last seven years, our company, Nunatsiavut Marine, has managed the operations of this ferry. Um, we crewed the boat, we ran the boat, we took af looked after the reservations, did the freight service. It's an old boat, it's 30 odd years old, so it needed to be replaced. Our provincial government, who runs the ferry service, had put out a request for proposals to um, replace the ferry service within Nunatsiavut. They had put, initially put out an RFP probably about five years ago. Um, and in that RFP, it identified that we, as a company, or that because this service was being provided within our territory, that consideration will be given to a qualified Inuit business, which is the wording within our land claims agreement. You know, fortunately, when our land claims was created, they understood the need for economic growth within our within our territory and that Inuit should be at the forefront of it. So they put clauses in to accommodate for that. So the RFP was put out, the, pro the province acknowledged that clause in our land claims agreement. And the Nunes have a group of companies put in a proposal to run the ferry service. The province, for some reason, felt they didn't have enough money to go forward with any of the proposals, so they canceled the RFP even though we had a, a beautiful bid in. So then last year, the province put out another RFP again, worded a little different in some sense, but ver worded very different in another sense that that whole clause in relation to an Inuit qualified business and acknowledging the land claims was completely omitted from the RFP, just completely gone. And I think that speaks volumes on where economic reconciliation exists in some provinces. Um, so we had considered what we would do. We ended up not putting in a full proposal like we did before, but we did manage to work with the other marine company within our territory and partnered with them to take advantage of whatever opportunity was left for us as a company, so we were still involved in the marine service. So we will be running the shore-based service for the whole marine service within Nunatsiavut. The company will be running the boat. Hopefully it works out to be a, a good partnership and a gr good agreement, but at least we still have some part in it. No thanks to our government. Oh, did I? Air Borealis is, um, it's, the airline that um, we have 33% ownership of within our territory. Um, the other partners in this is the provincial airlines airline company and the First Nations, the Inu um, Development Corporation. So it's actually, while it, we only own 33% of it, it's 66% indigenous owned, the airline. Um, this began in 2017 as a, we had an, our own airline that we had a partnership in. The Inu had the partnership with, with PAL through the airline, airline. So what they did was both of those sort of merged into this one Air Borealis. So it, it's, pretty, it's the only regional airline in our territory. It's the only way to get in and out in the winter. Um, so in six months, we carried about 14,000 passengers. We only used Twin Otters. Um, 1.4 million pounds of freight and 394 medevac hours. And for those that maybe don't understand a medevac hour, in our communities we have clinics that are manned by one or two nurses. That's it. That's all. We don't have doctors. We don't have roads. So if a medical emergency comes up and somebody needs, say somebody's ambulatory, you can't jump in an ambulance and drive to the hospital. The plane has to come and get you and take you out. So that's what we mean by 394 medevac hours. 
We have Torngate Services, Torngate Services Incorporated, TSI. TSI was, was created um, around the time Voices Bay started. Voices Bay, for those that may not be familiar, is Valley's mining operation um, within our territory. Um, they've recently um, announced that they are going underground. Work has started to go underground, so it's a big um, industry or economic driver for, for our communities. So TSI, um, they have two-thirds of our employees with TSI are, in, are indigenous. We're very proud with that. These are everything from carpenters to um, crane operators, ships loaders, that sort of thing. We have a very good training program to in, improve the indi indigenous skill sets. Again, it's one of those where we take people in. People might start working for TSI as, um, what do they call them, the, the seeders. Once an area is finished with in Voyages Bay, they go and seed it. So we'll have a six-week pro project in the summer where we have laborers come in and seed. They'll come in for several years and they'll gain a little bit of experience and TSI will take them on full time and find another position within the company. So we're, we're always building the capacity within our company and TSI is very good for that. Um, as well as the work at Voyages Bay, the permanent contract there, we recently did the Villard camps again for the Muskrat Falls project. Oh gosh, you want me to hurry up? Okay, perfect, I can do that. <laughs> I just like talking about our company. The town center in Goose Bay, um, it's a piece of land we own in the, in the community of Happy Valley Goose Bay. It's outside of our traditional territory, but it's, we have a lot of beneficiaries there. We have um, a development area that we're looking at. Right now we've got one client in there, that's a, uh, that's a gym. More recently the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay is putting their massive wellness center in there, which is a bonus, and we're hoping to get more people moving into that area. Um, Timiak is our bigger construction company. Right now one of the big projects that Timiak is working on is a civil work within the Voices Bay project. Again, these, while we have a partnership with Timiak, with Bird on this, we're very involved in the partnership in ensuring that Inuit are getting hired in the company and we're, we're working very closely with our partners to make sure that they do get hired. Nuluak is our, our fishing entity. We own quota, we get somebody to fish it, um, and that's a partnership that works really well for us. We don't have our own boats, so we get somebody else to fish it for us. INL, Integrated Nunit Seabut Logistics, is a, is a barge service that we have. We do a lot of work with Voices Bay um, in getting the equipment to and from the Voices Bay site, and we did some work with Muskrat Falls. Um, our corporate social responsibility, I'm just really going to speed up. Um, we gave in excess of $250,000 in donations. Our most recent project is a food bank. We commit to giving back to the communities every year. Food security is at a 74% in, food security is at 74% in some of our communities. So in a way to give back to our communities, we donated to the food banks. Um, the environment, we have stewardship programs. We're cleaning up some of our sites, post mill lumber being one of them. It's, it's a site that LIDC had and doesn't, nothing's happening there anymore. Um, health and safety, we have ongoing training, workers' comp rebate. Um, again, supporting employment. More than half of our employees are, NG, are Nunez Habut beneficiaries. We are now hiring more at a senior management level. We're hiring more beneficiaries at a senior management level. Um, we we look at giving back to projects that are important to our culture, like helping the Nain Youth Choir. We're partners with the Arctic Inspiration Prize. Again, we report annually to the assembly. Um, we had done some work with, with sort of moving ahead and where we're going. These are some of the things we're going to do. We, ha we continue to do being open and transparent, committing to our our culture and our values. How's that for wrapping it up quickly? <laughs> <laughs> and 
I have water everywhere. Thank you. So clearly you can see that uh, our Inuit regions with our Inuit organizations and their uh, different Inuit development corporations and businesses are trying and in many areas succeeding in uh, securing um, contracts, uh, especially government contracts to provide the infrastructure in our regions as well as uh, some training and employment and, and other benefits. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity um, to share with you that uh, there's a new um, organization called Arctic 360. Uh, Jessica uh, Shadian is here, so if you don't mind just standing up so that people can actually see who you are. She's uh, um, taking a lead in working with our northern governments and our Inuit and Indigenous uh, corporations as well as actually the investment sector in the south and especially in Bay Street to look at trying to do some of the research that's needed and required to actually look at our economic opportunities in the north. Uh, specifically, you know, what is that inventory? Where are the gaps? Where are those opportunities? So that, you know, there's more of a strategy or plan to help our northern peoples our, um, and our governments to see where we can invest. And because uh, then those strategies um, can help actually secure the much needed funding um, for us to make the business cases on where to invest those funds, whether it's our collective wealth as Inuit people or government money, you know, different levels, and actually the growing interest of the private sector, not only within Canada, but actually worldwide, that wants to look at investing in the North. So um, if you're interested in the work that uh, Arctic 360 is doing, there's also another initiative, which I'm glad to share with you, is looking actually developing a mentorship program or an internship program for people, our people, uh, in the north who are interested in looking at uh, work opportunities and experiences in financial management, in particular the investment world, um, gaining experience, you know, in places like um, uh, M the M BMO, Bank of Montreal, um, and many others. Um, we've got actually quite a number of, uh, of very big, I would say, investment um, um, firms that are super keen not only to invest that uh, their funds in the north but actually invest in our people invest by providing them those opportunities and growing those relationships so um yay we are short on time but i did actually want to open up the room to if you had any questions regarding key mechanisms to achieving economic reconciliation um, Are there any questions? Jessica, do you want to take, give, Thank you so much. I'll, I'll bring a mic. She's gonna, he's gonna bring a mic, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, my question maybe, uh, well, my question's for Andy, and um, toward, you know, the end of your presentation, you discussed the possibility or the, maybe the necessity to revisit the James Bay uh, Northern Quebec Agreement because it was something that was done uh, at a different time. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I just would, I'd be, I'd be interested to get maybe some more, um, you know, of your thinking on, on that process. And um, um, I wonder, um, w in terms of how, you know, that would open a lot of can of worms, I imagine. And, um, and, is, and, and are there alternatives to, to to creating, I don't know, maybe new policies within the existing agreement that could, um, I, I don't know. I would just like to hear more about your thoughts about that because it's, it's really fascinating and I think you're, what you were saying earlier is, is very well said. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I can only imagine what the signatories went through. I wasn't born yet when they signed the agreement. They had limited education. They were part of the residential school era. They were part of the 60s group. Um, one of our negotiators was actually one of three experimental Eskimos being sent down to uh, to Ottawa 
to see if they can assimilate them within the general population, or so to speak. Um, but in regards to um, reopening the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement, I, I think if they really mean reconciliation, true reconciliation, um, there is a lot of wrong that was done. Um, not having the education that we do now, um, the knowledge that we do now, and understanding the facts at a later date that basic human rights uh, were being negotiated for uh, that, are, are, that already exist for the rest of Canada, uh, that we had to basically sell uh, in regards to get this agreement done. Um, education. Ed education is, is basically uh, a right for every Canadian to have access to. But yet, we had to trade off our land for it. Um, yet, we don't have access to any post-secondary facilities in the, in the north. So we have to travel thousands of miles away to access education. Um, away from our families for extended periods of time when for the rest of the country it is in their backyards. So basically those are many factors like that that need to be revisited in order to to basically reconcile all the uh, unfair trade-offs that were done. Uh, I mean Nunavik Inuit are talking about one third the size of the province of Quebec. Uh, basically, the size of France that we're talking about that we let go because of what rest of the can what the rest of the country has has already had access to. So, were we foreigners in order to get the same equivalent, but we had to sell our land for it? I mean, there's there's a lot of questions, um, and like I said, they didn't have the education back then. But I do believe we do have that educa the educated people now. Um, I'm not talking about myself. We have many individuals that have completed university, um, Inuit that have multiple master's degrees um, under their belts now, and that could take the lead on this. So, but it's something that uh, that needs to be looked at carefully. Uh, there, we understand there's a risk. Like you said, there's. Uh, there could be a can of worms. Uh, does the government have a hard time trying to deal with housing? I mean, housing in there is clearly identified that they should provide housing sufficient to the population growth as well as other factors. They're not. We've won in court before uh, in regards to that factor. So they, would they want to look at that option and not having so much of a fiduciary responsibility? on that so there's a lot there's there's some risk to it but uh, I do I do believe you already have an agreement if you do, if you can't come to an agreement then you you still have that existing one to live off so so just for those who may not know um, most of our modern day land claim agreements um, do provide for certain sort of rights, a lot of it around fishing, um, proportional representation sometimes in our government, uh, preferential consideration potentially for government procurement. But there's nothing in those agreements with respect to commitments by the governments on infrastructure, on education, uh, key pieces of infrastructure, sometimes like a university, which are both, therefore, you know, a university is infrastructure, but it's also education and that, you know, key component of being able to develop our people's capacity, but also the economies um, that universities often can generate and support. So um, I, it's an interesting sort of uh, conversation that I'm starting to hear more and more from the North is sort of saying, you know, maybe these agreements aren't as good as they could or should be. And even if it just, you know, starts to get the governments to realize that they, there's a whole bunch of provisions in the, in the claim that are not being adequately uh, fulfilled. And as a result, did we get the you know the the benefits that we expected in exchange for the, the significant amount of, of land and resources that the Canadian government has now, you know, legal certainty over? 
So good question, and thank you for the, the extra response. Uh, yes. Thank you, Madeline. So my question's for Andy. I really appreciated hearing about the work that's gone into the development of the Inuit uh, Enterprise Registry. Very interesting how you're looking at the scoring that's going to result in real procurement, a real procurement strategy. Having said that, it's, it's no big secret when we talk about the federal procurement strategy for Aboriginal business that it's less than functional, <laughs> um, being very polite, of course. And I'm wondering, Andy, your thoughts or your vision, how the work you're doing in procurement would interface with a federal strategy looking forward? Well, we do, we do have um, not so much business coming from the federal government. Everything is more or less transferred to the provincial government. So the key component would be working with the provincial government to make sure that this policy uh, is implemented properly. But at the same time, we also have to take into account there are other procurement policies that do exist. Uh, like you said, uh, maybe it needs a bit of tune-up and maybe uh, maybe this would allow that opportunity to be looked at. Um, but it, it, it's if we're looking at proper and I, I guess tangible uh, economic reconciliation, that's allowing and giving the powers to the regions themselves to be able to decide and structure their own way that is fair and equitable to uh, to the population that reside. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically our lives, it's the communities we live in, so it's that important aspect of, of it that will allow us to to take control, to to allow our our, our Inuit legitimate Inuit companies to thrive, uh, and this is something that would be key um, in order to uh, to work with both federal and provincial governments. And so maybe what you know, I'm being told I have to wrap up. So what I'd like to add is that uh, again, for maybe people who um, may not realize, is how big and important government is in in developing our economies. They're often the biggest employer. They're the ones with the largest uh, amount of funds, um, and their government procurement around building infrastructure or the programs or services. You know, even you know, for companies that are getting into providing providing medevac, ambulance services. So that's a healthcare related service, which has now been uh, in some regions uh, privatized. So it's not quite the same in the South in so much as that uh, this is why Inuit um, you know, look to that uh, government investment, that government procurement, and developing you know, um, a procurement policy that delivers real benefits. Uh, for real Inuit businesses, um, not just sort of um, uh, seeing, as you heard earlier, uh, southern companies coming up who aren't partnering with our northern um, partners, because I think that's where the strength and, and the opportunities really, really lie, especially as we're trying to develop this capacity is, you know, um, sharing those expertise, but we also know the northern reality. You know, more time and time again, we see, you know, you just go, oh my God, you didn't listen to the elders not to build there. Or you see that uh, um, recently in the paper that uh, housing that has been built in, in the north, but not to Arctic conditions or Arctic standards, and therefore causing, you know, children to be, have mold sores all over their body and a whole bunch of respiratory illnesses. So we need those, you know, southern sometimes expertise, gain that capacity, develop those partnerships, um, build to northern realities and, and to our northern and cultural needs. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, we'll see uh, better outcomes as a result um, that are financially uh, viable and worthwhile and uh, result in uh, better health and social outcomes for our people as well. So thank you to the panel for sharing your experiences and we're going to take a break, uh, 10 minutes so that we can try to get back on track.